for those who feel comfortable sharing, and I know that some of you may not, um, who here has suffered or is suffering from depression? Because that's certainly something I've encountered. Okay, a lot of you. Um, I will do a, a little bit of a trigger warning. Um, I'm going to be talking about some of my personal experiences. Um, this is sort of a cross between personal experiences and, uh, and neuroscience, and, um, and a few lolcats as well. And um, the personal experiences, um, I they were triggering to me. I hope they won't be too triggering for you, but um, I do want to put that out there. So, as some of you may know, when I, uh, late last year, um, I had this experience where I made myself a sandwich. And um, the sandwich should have been incredible. The sandwich was made with this amazing bread, and it was made with, like, you know, fresh hummus that I'd prepared myself. And, um, hello, clicker. Here we go, fresh hummus that I'd prepared myself, and, like, my favorite cheese, and, like, these slow-roasted vegetables with white wine and stock. And, and this was a sandwich I was really looking forward to eating, really, really, really looking forward to eating. It was, as far as I was concerned, the best sandwich ever. And what surprised me, and it was a genuine surprise when I actually ate this sandwich, is that I gained zero enjoyment from it. Eating the sandwich was not something that I found pleasurable at all, and really, I could have just left it there for all it was worth. And the reason for this is that I was experiencing a state known as anhedonia, and that is the inability to experience pleasure. And so, sandwiches weren't really my thing. And so, you know, this happened, and I'm like, well, I'm having a hard day. And when you're having a hard day, sometimes things aren't that much fun, and you don't enjoy your sandwiches. So, you know, this is nothing to worry about, clearly. Later that month, I had uh, another experience, which is unusual for me. Um, for two hours, I lay on my bed. And that's normal. I like to nap. I like to read books. Um, but I didn't move. I wasn't napping. And I wasn't really thinking. I wasn't doing anything. The best I can describe this experience is that um, it was like not existing, except that I was, had this little faint little level of consciousness there. And um, that was also a bad day. And this was almost a pleasant experience compared to how I was feeling, because I wasn't feeling any emotions. I wasn't feeling bad at all about this. It was just this nothingness. And what got me up after two hours of lying completely still was this tiny little voice in my head, my little research brain saying, Paul, this is an unusual behavior for you, and, and it has to have a name. And you have to research it. You have to look this up. You have to see what this means. And so I, I dragged myself off the bed, and I slowly made my way over to my laptop, and I found this term, psychomotor retardation. And that's exactly what I had. It absolutely described my symptoms. And again, what I found surprising was that this was one of the many symptoms of a major depressive episode. And I thought, well, I don't have depression. You know, there's this great big list of things here, but I'm just having a hard day. And as it was, I track my mood, and I'd been having a hard day pretty much every day for the last six weeks. And to be um, uh, diagnosed with depression, you need like five things off this list, including one of the first two. And as it happened, I had almost everything that was on that list. And I had a really hard time convincing myself that there was something actually wrong, because this did not fit in with my view of myself. I was this guy who was happy, who was outgoing, who like traveled around the world and got up to really awesome cool shit. I was not the sort of person to get depression. And yet I had this. And so I'm going to be arguing as part of this talk that this is one of the worst diseases that you can encounter. Um, this is a disease which sucks the meaning out of life. This is a disease which really makes you indifferent to everything around you. And if you have like a, a broken leg or something, you can go and enjoy pictures of the cats on the internet. But if you have depression, that's not really available to you. So how did this start? Well, it, it started with sadness. And um, I had a, a romantic relationship end, and I was sad about that, and that happens. And how this is supposed to go is you then feel grief. 
something bad happens, you feel sad about that, you feel grief, and then you get through it. That's what's supposed to occur. What happened with me is I ended up with these cyclic thoughts, and they were intrusive. They kept on pushing their way back into my mind, no matter how often I tried to get rid of them, and they'd keep on going around and around and around in circles. And that really sucked my energy out. And I found that I had this sandwich experience. I was living in this world that just felt completely gray. And so it ruined my motivation, it ruined my social skills, and, and nothing seemed fun. And really, nothing anymore seemed to have a point. It's like, yeah, I could do this work for my client, but what's the point in that? Or I could you know, submit something to this conference, but life is ultimately meaningless, so why should I bother? And it really, really sucked. Now, I've, I'm glad to say that I've never had thoughts of suicide before, but holy crap, I can understand why. I can really, really understand why people would feel that way. And it's not a case of... It's just living didn't seem to have much point. What I did struggle with was loneliness. And as a very, very social person, this was something that I wasn't very used to. And so I said, okay, I'm feeling lonely. What do I do if I'm feeling lonely? I should go and hang out with friends. And that seemed like a great idea, but what I discovered is when I went and hung out with my friends, I felt that I couldn't connect with them. So my friends were there and I was interacting with them, but I still felt lonely. And worst of all, like I couldn't feel happy, and I really couldn't do emotions all that well, and I just felt that I was bringing them down. And it was a huge amount of work to make my friends' lives suck. And so I started avoiding people. And that was very easy, because I didn't have a lot of motivation, I didn't have a lot of energy. But if you're lonely and you start avoiding people, that makes you more lonely. So that was one of these cycles that I'd encountered, that loneliness made me lonely. Other ones that I've seen people encounter is that they have problems at work, and the problems at work make them depressed. And the reason they're having troubles is because they're depressed. This is my personal one here. That's how I felt whenever I was around my friends. So I really didn't want to burden my friends anymore. I realized that I was you know, not really giving them any sense of, of accomplishing anything and making me feel better. And so, in what I suspect is somewhat my fashion, um, I said, okay, I'm not going to burden my friends. I'm going to burden the entire freaking internet. <laughs> Especially those bastards who write comments on YouTube. And so, I wrote an open letter. I'm not expecting you to be able to read this, but I wrote this open letter, and I tweeted it, and I put it on all the social media, and this got spread far and wide, and I turned off all of my devices, and I went and, I don't know, I slept for a couple of hours or something, and I came back and all of my inboxes were full, everything was full. And what that did is it at least secured me uh, levels of support, modes of support from uh, some friends who didn't know, and there was a lot of friends who didn't know, uh, from people who cared about me who I didn't realize who cared about me. Um, but it didn't make me feel better. I was doing this very much for other people's benefits. And whilst I would like to say that I didn't feel anything at this time, the truth was that I could feel something. And this is a little bit hard for me to admit, because this is absolutely something I did not want to be feeling at all, and completely not in the way it manifested itself. I could still feel hate. And what was worse, is that I hated people. And people were like the best thing in the world for me. People were the reason why I was living and doing everything. And yet I found that whenever I had an interaction with, with anyone, not people from YouTube, like my friends, I ended up hating my friends. And that sucked. Absolutely sucked. Now the thing was that I actually knew that people were great. The, the rational part of my mind was like, no, Paul, People are just fine. They're not changing. They're actually trying to help you. There's nothing wrong here. But inside, I felt that they were being colossal jerks. And when I looked to see why did I feel they were colossal jerks, what was the line of reasoning there, there wasn't any line of reasoning that you could really say was, was rational. That was actually how I would think.
And so I had this constant internal conflict that I had these emotions, which were awful emotions, which I absolutely despised. And every time they came up, I would say, no, no, that doesn't make sense. Your friends are fantastic people. And it was this internal conflict uh, which really felt, I felt, sustained my depression because I did not want to give in to those emotions. I wanted to continually just stop them and say, no, no, brain, you're wrong. This is wrong. And that continued for a long time. And eventually, it became too hard to do that. It became too hard to fight. And I made a deal with myself. And um, the deal went a little bit like this. I would like people less. I would give in to that part of me that says that people are awful. I joked with my role-playing friends, I would take a point in misanthropy. And, um, and in return, that internal conflict would cease. Because now I no longer had this tension between people are awesome, what I'm thinking, and people are terrible, what I'm feeling. Now I'm saying, well, people suck, and I'm like, meh, whatever. So, you know, that ceased, and it worked. It actually, honest to goodness, worked. That was the point at where I started to, uh, my symptoms started to alleviate, I started to, to recover, and I say recover in quotes there. The problem was, it came with this awful cost. Because I liked people less. I became less compassionate. I became less caring. I felt that my ethics were compromised because now I didn't care about people as much as I used to. I felt like an awful person. And most of all, I felt like less of the person that I wanted to be. And this took a long time for me to try and figure out how to live in that state because I was so used to going, people are fantastic. And if anything goes wrong, I will just throw myself at a bunch of people and you know, we'll all be happy together. And that wasn't an option that was available to me anymore. So I describe myself as still recovering. Um, I'm certainly better than I was at the start of this year, um, but I'm nowhere near back to where I used to be. But this left me with a big question in my mind, that little research part of my mind that would get me out of beds and have me stay up late indexing papers, and that was, why the hell did this happen? What the hell was going on inside my brain and in other people's brains? So one thing that we know about depression is that it has a genetic component. People talk about depression running in families. And in fact, if you look at the research, about 50% of your risk of depression is genetic. Now, we know that by examining twins, and there are these fantastic twin registries. And um, here we have a graph. And you can see that if you have the highest genetic liability, if you have an identical twin who has depression, you have a much, much higher chance than if you have a uh, monozygotic twin, a, an identical twin who doesn't have depression. So definitely this makes a difference. But the thing to note here is that the scale on the bottom, severe life event, if you're not experiencing a severe life event, your chances of starting a major depressive episode is absolutely minimal. If you are experiencing a severe life event, suddenly it skyrockets, and that is when depression, sorry, that is when genetics seem to make a big difference. We also know that if it's 50% genetic, then it's 50% not genetic. There is other stuff going on. And in fact, what I showed you in that graph may give you some ideas as to what might be triggering that. The other problem with depression is that it's not technically a disease, it's a syndrome. It is a collection of underlying pathologies, things which might go wrong, which all result in this thing which we call depression. And, and even what we call depression is kind of a little bit here and there. So I had what was technically melancholic depression, and it's associated with things like insomnia, things like loss of appetite, anhedonia, waking up early. All of those things were things I encountered. And I almost guarantee you, if you looked at my stress hormones, they would have been through the roof. The other types of depression which you see, there's seasonal affective disorder. It comes and goes based on the seasons. You have people getting depressed after they've given birth. You have what's called atypical depression. Atypical depression involves increased appetite, particularly for carbohydrates, and where people uh, sleep more rather than less. It's like the opposite of these, of what I had. But um, it's still classed as depression. So lumping these all together is an, an interesting thing. The other thing we know is that 
treatment for major depressive episodes um, is at best 50% effective. Now, that's for a full remission of symptoms. And when I say treatment, that includes um, drugs, that includes therapies, and that includes lifestyle changes as well. So sometimes we can get people out of this, and sometimes we can kind of, and sometimes we can't. It's very, very hard. And this is absolutely in line with the syndrome idea that there might be something going on, but we're not really sure what it is. And so, you know, you kind of roll the, the treatment dice and see if it works. And so I say there's this syndrome that it's hard to understand what's going on. Why is it hard? I mean, we've had antidepressants around for, what, 60, 70 years now. You know, surely we should be understanding what's going on there. Uh, surely we should be understanding at least when to prescribe those and when not to prescribe them, because we know that they don't work with everyone. And um, one of our theories of what's happening with depression, and I say one of them because there are many theories and there may be multiple ones which are correct, is this thing called the monoamine hypothesis. And um, this is the one that a lot of people have heard about. Now, I can't talk about neurotransmitters without showing you this diagram. And um, this is how nerve cells talk to each other. And of course, they always talk from left to right. So on the left-hand side here, um, it wants to send a signal. And it does that by squirting neurotransmitters into the, what we call the synaptic cleft. And on the right-hand side, they hit these receptors, and you spark off a signal on the right-hand cell. What's interesting is what happens to those neurotransmitters after they've been squirted out. There's two things you can do. One is that you can recycle them, you can reuptake them back into the original cell, um, or you can dispose of them. You can um, break them down and flush them out. So there's two different mechanisms going on there for, for clearing them out of the synaptic cleft. And the monoamine hypothesis deals with particular neurotransmitters, ones you've probably heard of, um, serotonin, dopamine, and then depending upon which country you're in, either noradrenaline or norepinephrine. They're exactly the same thing, but if you're in Australia, you say noradrenaline. If you're over here, you say norepinephrine. And the monoamine hypothesis started back in the 1950s um, when we discovered these things called monoamine oxidase inhibitors that would stop the breakdown of these particular neurotransmitters. And what it was discovered is that if you gave these to some people, it would make them feel better. That's great. And so the theory was that these people had too few monoamines. What was going on is they had too few of these neurotransmitters floating around. You inhibited them breaking down. You had more of them in these clefts and everything. And maybe if there was something wrong with the signaling, that the signaling wasn't getting through, by increasing these levels, you would increase those signals. So that was the theory. That's the monoamine hypothesis. Now, what we also discovered, if you gave people these uh, MAO inhibitors, um, they could also go into a hypertensive crisis if they ate cheese, and then they could die. So we don't tend to give them to people except as a line of last resort, because you know if you can't have cheese, then that's not going to make you very happy. So these have been refined based upon this hypothesis, and these days you see these SSRIs, these selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And what they do is rather than stopping um, serotonin and these other amines from being broken down, um, they stop them from being recycled back into the cell. So same idea, you increase the levels in the synaptic cleft. Now what's fascinating is that we know that um, there is a genetic component with, um, with depression. And in fact, one of the things which was discovered when we started looking at genetics is that, hey, people who are prone to depression um, have this interesting difference in like one little area of this chromosome and everything. And when we looked at it, that actually had to do with serotonin transport. So suddenly, we think this has to do with serotonin. We find genetic evidence that serotonin is implicated. And um, sure enough, this is great evidence for the hypothesis. Now, what's fascinating here is that I'm not going to go into all the details of this gene, but there's a little red arrow on the left there. And that's uh, pointing to what's known as the promoter region. If you have a big promoter region at the start of this gene, you have lots of gene expression. You produce lots of these transporters. The transporters transport serotonin back into the cell. Um, if you have a small promotion region, then what happens is you have a smaller number, a fewer number of these transporters, and you transport less serotonin back into your cell. And as it happens, that promoter region seems to be very, very important. So we'll see how. Now, given that we think there's something happening with this transport, 
um, one of the first things which people did was they made mouse models. So you have these knockout mice where rather than saying, you know, we're going to give you a small number of um, uh, reuptake um, transporters, uh, we're going to get rid of them entirely. So you have mice who simply cannot get serotonin back into the cells, back into the vesicles. And then they said, well, what happens with these mouses' um, mental states? Now, it's interesting. There's a whole field of study of how do you tell if a mouse has depression, how do you tell if a mouse has some other sort of mental disorder, as it is, these mice have very, very high rates of depression. And as you'd expect, they also have very high rates of serotonin in the synaptic cleft, because nothing can reabsorb this. You're only you know, allowing these to be washed out and broken down. And this causes problems with signaling, because normally, if you have like you know the regular um, uh, transporters, if you're not signaling, you have a low level of serotonin, and if you are signaling, you have a high level. If you're one of these knockout mice, because there's so much serotonin floating around, if you're not signaling, you have a high level, and if you are signaling, you have an even higher level. And it's really, really hard to tell the difference there. So there's a whole bunch of sort of miswiring that goes on in trying to transmit signals in these knockout mice. And as I said, they're highly susceptible to depression. So what happens if you take these depressed mice and you give them MAO inhibitors? Those are the things which stop you from breaking down serotonin and other monoamines. So they already have heaps of this stuff sloshing around, and it's like, yo, dog, I heard you like serotonin. What happens? Well, they don't actually recover from depression. They die. They end up with like so much serotonin floating around in their brains, they can no longer thermoregulate. Homostasis goes out the window. These things die because they've got so much of this here. Now, humans, unless you are incredibly unlucky, in your um, genetic mutations, if you're a human, you will have these transporters. You'll be able to get serotonin back into your cells. But this is still an interesting question of like, does this have any impact on our drugs? Well, remember what I said, if you have a, um, a small promoter region, you will have a fewer number of transporters. If you have a large promoter region, you'll have lots of transporters. So if you have a small number of transporters, you'll have more serotonin floating around in your synaptic clefts. If you then block the reuptake of that, of that serotonin with the very small number of transporters you have, what do you think happens? And what happens is people show these side effects which are very mild forms of serotonin toxicity. And in fact, if you look at people um, discontinuing uh, medications, these SSRI medications, people with too short, because you've got two chromosomes, people with too short promoter regions are way more likely to discontinue them. They go, no, I just can't do this, it's driving me nuts. I do not feel good on these. People with long promoter regions tend to do just fine. So this is a very clear interaction between genetics and drug response. As it happens, there is another class of drugs for treating depression called SSREs, Selective Serotonin Reuptake Enhancers. And they do the complete opposite of SSRIs. And they're also useful in treating depression. They're not approved for use in America, but they are approved for use in Europe. And it wouldn't surprise me, I have no evidence to back this up, but it would not surprise me that if you're one of the people who has too short uh, promoter regions, you have lots of serotonin floating around, that maybe something which enhances getting that out of the synaptic cleft is actually going to be more useful to you. You may respond better to that. There is also one enormous problem with the monoamine hypothesis, and this has been plaguing people forever. And that is that if you give somebody a drug, if you give somebody a pharmaceutical, those normally act on a scale of seconds to hours. If I give you um, a, a painkiller, if you have a glass of beer, if you do any of these things, you smoke a cigarette, whatever, those things act very, very quickly. And in fact, the side effects for antidepressants do happen very, very quickly. But if you're looking at recovery time, that tends to be days or weeks. So there's this whole question of why is there this therapeutic lag between giving people antidepressants and them actually getting better, when they do get better. And so we don't think that the monoamine hypothesis is the whole story. We think there's something else going on. The best idea of what we have, which is going on, or the best idea that I have found, is this thing called brain-derived neurotrophic factor. 
and this seems to fit very well, although we're not exactly sure how changing your brain chemistry might actually influence this. Also known as BDNF. What BDNF does is it promotes your cells to be happy and healthy. And so you have more BDNF and your cells flourish, they grow more, there's more neurogenesis in the hippocampal regions, um, they get along better with their friends, they form more connections, they have more satisfying social lives. So these are great for your brain cells. And in fact, you can look at what's happening underneath and you have these, these dendritic uh, plates, these dendritic sites where you can make these connections. People in depressed states often don't have enough of these. And if you manage to get them to increase their BDNF levels, they grow all of these cells and the depression seems to go into remission. One thing that supports this hypothesis that BDNF has something to do with it is exercise. A lot of people report that exercise makes them feel better. Exercise is used as a treatment for depression. Exercise is also very well understood that it increases the levels of BDNF. So that would make sense if that was involved. The other thing which we see is stress. People having depressive episodes, particularly the first depressive episode, there is usually some huge stressor there which is involved. And stress absolutely destroys your ability to produce BDNF. Because your brain is like, no, I have to run away from lions. I can't spend all this time growing new brain cells. That's crazy. And so stress is a huge predictor for when you might have a depressive episode. In fact, as far as I can find, stress is the largest predictor of when somebody might have an episode. Now, there's an interesting graph here, um, which I think very clearly shows the relationship um, between stress and genetics. And what is fascinating here is that if you've had a small number of stressful life events, it doesn't seem to do anything in terms of increasing your chances of depression, or in this case, increasing your suicide risk, which is strongly correlated with depression. However, if you have a number of stressful life events and you happen to have two short promoter regions, that's where things suddenly diverge very, very strongly. And we're not really sure why this happens. So that is a little bit of an explanation as to why understanding depression is hard. That there's this very interesting mix of theories, of chemicals, of genetics, and it is very, very hit and miss in terms of giving people therapies. And that brings me to the next point here, which I want to discuss, which is cure evangelism. And this does not just apply for depression, this applies for um, any sort of disease, particularly chronic diseases, uh, where people are like, oh, you're feeling sad. Well, you know, I felt sad once, and, and what I did is I went to the beach and I did yoga at sunrise or I started watching Adventure Time, or you should read webcomics, or you should stop reading webcomics. Like, people come up with all of these ideas as to what you could do to get better. And if you were in this state where you just, you can hardly move, that's exhausting. And even if you're in a state where, like, you know, maybe you've got a bit of energy, but, like, people are doing this all the time, it's exhausting. And very often what happens is they don't understand what you've tried, what your current state is. I absolutely felt like this. Absolutely, I felt like this. There is also the reverse of cure evangelism. And the reverse of cure evangelism is when some, somebody says, hey, don't do this, don't try this treatment because it doesn't work. And what they actually mean there is don't try this because it didn't work for me or it didn't work for somebody who wrote comments on YouTube. And so this, because there's such a wide range of what could be going on, is not really something which is helpful. I know people where antidepressants have absolutely helped. Um, I know one person who says that he's got this lovely family, he's got this great job, he has this very, very happy life, but if he goes off the antidepressants, guaranteed in three months' time, he will hate everything in the world. So that is somebody who absolutely has responded to this. I have other people who have tried antidepressants and absolutely no difference whatsoever. It's been awful. So this is not something where you can say, this worked for me, it's going to work for you. The best advice I have if somebody tells you that they are depressed is to acknowledge that. Say, hey, I'm, I'm sorry you're feeling that way. Um, you might ask them, is there anything I can do to help? And maybe there is, maybe there isn't, but really what I found most of all that I wanted was just plain acknowledgement. I didn't want people to try and fix me. 
So acknowledge and support, but don't try to fix, unless they ask you. The final things which I want to mention, um, for those of you who don't know about it, um, there is a website called bluehackers.org. Um, there's a lot of stories up there from people in open source um, who have had to deal with depression in one form or another. And um, certainly my stories are up there as well, so feel free to read those if you want. And also there is a, a boff happening tonight at 8 o'clock, um, a Blue Hackers boff. Um, I will be there. Um, I know that Ed, who's giving the other depression talk, will be there as well. Um, if you have dealt with depression or you're dealing with someone else who has it or you're just curious, please feel free to come along there. Um, it should be a, a safe place. And finally, if you are dealing with depression or you've dealt with depression, then I am very, very sorry, and I know that that sucks, and you are not alone. Thank you. So I know that all of you, where's my, my thank you? I know that all of you uh, will be saying at this point, wait, citation needed. Um, so if you go to tinyurl.com, OzCon2013 depression, um, every single paper that I have referenced in this talk is there as alongside a number of papers which I didn't reference, but which I found to be particularly interesting. Now, I believe that I have seven minutes left before I have to clear the room. Um, does anyone have any questions? And if you do, good luck, because I don't know if I've got a microphone to hand you. Yes. Sorry, could you speak up? Um, Egal was a, a local Portland community member um, who ran an enormous number of everything, of user groups who was involved with a conference here, Open Source Bridge. Um, and there was a very tragic incident, which I'd actually prefer not to go into on stage, because, yeah. Um, but yes, that's the reference there. Denise. Obviously, you're evangelizing the mm -hmm. right? Uh, what kind of evangelism do you think you're doing? Mm-hmm. OK, so the, um, the question was, um, cure evangelism sucks. Um, but how can we make more information available um, if people are having problems with the medical establishment, which is something I can definitely uh, understand. Have I paraphrased there correctly? Okay. Um, one thing that I have found uh, useful for myself is, and I don't have these in the slides, unfortunately, um, there's a couple of websites out there, one of which is called Patients Like Me. And um, I don't know if anyone here has encountered this. It's not just for depression. Um, if you have any sort of illness, you can actually keep track of what are my symptoms, uh, what are my medications, how am I feeling, so on and so forth. And um, that certainly provides you with opportunities to say, okay, there are other people um, who have whatever condition I have. And one of the great things about that website is you can actually see, see things like what level of efficacy is there um, for this treatment that somebody is taking. So it's like, OK, there are 3,000 other people that we have um, who have um, this particular um, syndrome or condition that you have. Um, here's what they're doing as treatment. 87% of people found that this treatment worked. And so that can give you an opportunity to say, hey, I've never heard of that before. Maybe that's something which I can raise with my, my healthcare professional. So that is something which certainly I find very interesting and useful. Um, my big complaint with patients like me is they give you no easy way to get to your own data. So me as a data geek, I want to download everything. I want to crunch everything. And um, they don't have any APIs. And if you email them, they will actually send you like CSV files. And they'll be very confused as to why would you ever want these CSV files when you can have these beautiful graphs in like flash formats and everything. Um, but at least they send them to you, which is, which is very, very nice. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, Denise, but that's certainly one thing which I've found useful. Um, the other thing, just before I go on to the next question, is that there is a, a website called Moodscope. Um, which is also where I track my mood. And it's, it's interesting, I have some problems with it, um, but it gets much, much better if you're willing to do web scraping and you can work with JSON. Um, so I find it's way, way better once I started writing my own interfaces. Um, we had a question way up the back there.
So the question was um, a discussion of short versus long promoter regions um, for gene expression. Is there a test for that? So the problem is that because these are promoter regions, they're not what we call SNPs, which are uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, if you've got something like 23andMe, for example, um, you can't just go there and go, OK, so how long is this region? Because that was the very first thing I asked, can I check for this? Um, I believe that there is an SNP, and I know that is actually tracked by 23andMe, um, which is related to the short and the long promoter regions, but I don't know how it's related. So I don't know if it's like if you have this, then there's a 70% chance that you have this, which is like not going to be very useful, or if it's like absolutely if you see this in this point, then you have short or you have long. So I still have to check that. Yes? Mm -hmm. So the, the, the question was, um, with a, a brief summary, that um, having uh, SAD, seasonal affective disorder, um, can make one really think about what makes life worth living. Because the down times are bad, but it's like, okay, so what do I want to do in the good times? Have I summarized that correctly? Okay. Okay, so have I found anything that I can consider to be good out of depression? The only thing, um, well, the thing which immediately springs to mind is I'm standing here and I'm giving this talk. And, um, um, and I've written letters and I've done a lot of very sort of public admissions that I had this episode. Um, I have had people come to me and thank me for that. I've had people come to me and say, thank you for talking about this. And in particular, I've had people um, who have been struggling with depression themselves who have come to me and said, thank you for talking about this. I felt completely alone. I felt that nobody else in this community understood what was going on at all, and now I feel that someone else at least understands. And um, at least that was some good. That made me feel better about what had happened. Um, so I did a bunch of research. Um, I have had other people thank me. Um, have I seen anything which makes me go, yay, I've had depression, I've found this great new meaning of life from that? Uh, for me, unfortunately not, and I wish that I could say that. Um, but this was an awful thing which happened, and um, it's very hard to, for me to find meaning there, unfortunately. Um, I'm hoping that's different for everyone else. I'm really hoping that's different for everyone else. Now, I'm looking at the clock that I have here, so I know that I'm going to have to clear the room soon. Um, thank you all very, very much for coming. Um, if you do want to come to the Blue Hackers Boff tonight at 8 p.m., I would absolutely love to see you there. Um, and if at any point any of you spots me at the conference and you want to talk to me about this, um, or if you just want a hug or anything like that, then please let me know. I'm very, very happy to help. So thank you very much. <laughs>